Let's take our Bibles, let's hold them up high, and let's get right into the Word of God this, this uh, evening. At the count of three, it's our Gospel Lighthouse Declaration. This, this is the Word of God. Because I honor His Word, His blessings will chase me down and overtake me. I will be in the right place at the right time. I am surrounded by God's favor. I declare that He's able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that works in us. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. All right. Turn with me to the book of James, chapter 3 and verse 14. should be on your screen for your convenience. James chapter 3 and verse 14, when you find it, shout praise the Lord. It says, but if ye have bitter envying and strife in your hearts, glory not and lie not against the truth. This wisdom descendeth not from above, but is earthly, sensual, devilish. Verse 16 says, for where envying and strife is, there is confusion and every evil work. Tonight we're going to continue with our toxic series and we're going to be talking about envy tonight. All right? Take your neighbor by the hand as a point of contact and a sign of unity and let's ask God's blessings upon this word. Father, we love you. We're so thankful, Lord, for this honor that we have to stand behind your pulpit. We thank you, Lord, in the midst of all the things that are happening uh, with our sound equipment, with our video equipment, that you're God and you're in control and we worship you and praise you no matter what. And so, Lord, let this word go forth in power and demonstration of your spirit, a powerful seed planted in good ground to bring forth much fruit. And Holy Spirit, we know that you're in this room. We have felt your presence. We ask that you continue to lead and guide and direct us. Bring all things back to our remembrance, what has been spoken, what has been written. Give us insight for our eyesight. Open our ears that we may hear what you are saying to the church. And when we leave this place, we'll bear much fruit and continue to operate in your gifts. So confirm your word with signs and wonders. In the mighty, mighty name of Jesus, we pray. And everybody says, amen and amen. God bless you. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. Thank you for standing in reverence of the reading God's word. So we're going to look at tonight about envy. Now, what envy is, is someone has said, that envy is the art of counting the other fellow's blessings instead of your own, right? Has anybody ever had that in the season in your life, that situation where you wanted to compare yourself with somebody else? Um, it's funny because we were just talking about this this afternoon, my wife and I, and you drive up and down our, our subdivision, and you notice that someone gets a, a wreath, then someone else gets a wreath that's pretty close to it. And then someone gets the welcome board. And then before you know it, everyone on, on that block has the welcome board. Of course, we're different. We put gather because gather is our, is our uh, kind of our theme for our home. Uh, and so it seems like one person gets a new vehicle. Next thing you know, someone else is getting a new vehicle. It's like you're, it's, it's the phrase keeping up with the Joneses. Has anybody ever heard that phrase before? And so what we've learned, I guess, in a, in, for a long time, is that our consumer culture thrives on envy. We thrive on envy. This is nothing new to God because if you remember, the children of Israel, that, that was their mistake when they asked God for a king, they asked God for a king and they said, we want to be like the other nations who have kings. God said he wanted to be their king. Well, what happened? God gave them a king and they got what they wanted, but after a while they realized that they didn't want what they got, right? And so they've had problems ever since then with, with kings, evil kings. But what is envy? When you think about envy being a toxin that is uh, so detrimental to our Christian walk, what is envy? In, in biblical terms, is when you resent God's goodness in other people's lives and ignore God's goodness in your own life. That's pretty tough, but that's basically the conceptual uh, idea of envy according to the Bible. I'll say that one more time because some of you may not have heard what I said. It's envy is when you resent God's goodness in other people's lives. We're not talking about just being jealous, but we're talking about being envious. And then it's ignoring God's goodness in your own life. Remember the, the hymn? I think it was in a blue back hymnal, right? 
Count Your Many Blessings. Remember that song, Count Your Many Blessings, name them one by one. So what God is instructing us to do is to, is to determine this goal and make this goal reachable, achievable in our life, and it's this, is to learn to be content in all things. And everything, learn. Now, it's a process. He didn't say be content. He said learn to be content, right? So it's a process. It's something that we all have to go through. And Philippians chapter 4, verse 11, this is what Paul says to Philippi. He says, not that I speak in respect of want, for I have learned in whatsoever state I am therewith to be content. Amen? It's kind of funny of a story that I read where an immigrant to America was on an adventure of a lifetime with none other than a preacher, a preacher friend. What an adventure, right? Anybody ever been in an adventure with a preacher before? <laughs> and, when, <laughs> and when they were traveling, you have, going down to Houston, remember getting lost down in Houston? Um, when they were traveling through the New England states, the immigrant noticed a payphone with a sign on it, and it said, calls $10 per minute. The immigrant turned to the preacher and asked what the sign meant, and the preacher replied, oh, those are special phone booths to call heaven if you want to talk to God. And as they made it to the Tennessee River Valley and through Arkansas, he noticed that the sign read, calls $20 per minute. Still, the preacher gave the same reply. Those are special phone booths to call heaven if you want to talk to God. But when they crossed the state line into Oklahoma, the immigrant noticed a sign on the booths. The phone booths read, calls 10 cents per minute. The immigrant turned, on the pre turned to the preacher and asked, why is it only 10 cents per minute? And the preacher replied, oh, in Oklahoma, the calls to heaven are local calls. <laughs> so, everybody should laugh at that one, right? I know you guys hate that joke. But in envy, <laughs> envy takes on a variety of forms, and that's what we're going to disclose tonight. Materialistic envy, such as money, possession, even toys, clothes. Appearance envy is also another form of envy, right? I wish I had his hair, or I wish I had hair. <laughs> I, I wish I had her figure. I wish I had her skin tone. I wish I could jump like he can, right? And then there's relational envy. And relational envy is, is another form of envy, and it's this. I wish we were best friends. Anybody ever been there before? I know you guys look so holy tonight, but we know it, we all have dealt with this, right? I wish my husband was like her husband. Let me just tell you right now, no, you don't. <laughs> I think she said that too loud. I wish my wife was like his wife. And so when we think about envy, envy is insatiable, right? It is incapable of being satisfied. Because it's like you, you gain that. You get the new vehicle. You get the welcome sign. You get the new hairdo, new clothes, you know, new husband. Hope not. But anyway, you get these new things. And then all of a sudden you realize... It's not, it's not enough. It's like it continues. It's, a, it, it's, a, it's something that is insatiable. It's, it, you can't, it's incapable of ever being satisfied. You want more and more and more. And so that's what our life point is. And if you put that life point up there, Pastor Crystal, it's envy is incapable of being satisfied. So let's look at James chapter 3. James chapter 3 and 14. This is what it said. It says, but... If you have bitter envying and strife in your hearts, glory not, and look what it says, and lie not against the truth. Hmm. I, I find that in, in, uh, interesting that James writes it this way. Because I think a lot of times we are so good at being superficial with, our, with ourselves. We pretend we are actors in our own play. We pretend that everything is good, everything is fine. I heard a commercial the other day coming home from church, I think it was yesterday, and it was, it was spot on because people are honest with themselves. I mean, how often do people really truly open up? Well, 
People do, but when they do, they get hurt. They get burned, right? You don't blame them. But how many times are we honest with our own self? Knowing that we have, a, we're struggling with something within our, within our lives, but we tell people, we convince others that, oh, we don't have a problem with it, right? So I believe that he wants us to be honest, lie not against the truth. In verse 15, it says, this wisdom descendeth not from above, but is earthly, sensual, devilish. For, look at 16, it says, for where envying and strife is, there is confusion and every, every evil work. So we're so good at saying, Brother Dale, we're so good at saying, well, where strife is, all sin is present. You know, we get on our cliches, our Christianity, Christian cliches, but we leave out another aspect of that scripture where it says envy. Because there's a lot of pastors, there's a lot of leaders today who want to compromise so they can build a church like the church down the road. They want to compromise their messages so they will continue to keep, you know, the crowds. They want to compromise their standards so they won't fall into the category of the dying church. And that is, this is the absolute truth. And he says, don't lie against the truth. If there is envy, if there is a spirit of envy, hit it head on. Deal with it. Because it is a toxin. And if it's not dealt with, it will destroy. Because where envy is and strive, every evil work, and probably the worst component of that is confusion. The last thing the church needs is to be confused. Amen? Because we have a society today that is confused, that, that um, builds an agenda and a platform on confusion, applauds confusion. Do you realize that God says in, in the Corinthians that he is not the author of confusion, but of peace? Well, if God is not the author of confusion, then who is? The enemy, the devil. Proverbs 14 and 30, well, let, let's say this first. Jealousy, rage, bitterness, hate, murder, and grief all emerge from the toxic power of envy. I'm going to say that one more time. Jealousy, rage, bitterness, hate, murder, and grief all emerge from the toxic power of envy. Now, Proverbs 14 and 30 says this. It says, a sound heart is the life of the flesh, but envy the rottenness of the bones. Can you imagine the decay of, of your framework? People that reach a certain age, you know, the, the framework of their, their bones begin to decay. And can you imagine what, that's, that's how he is comparing this. The writer of Proverbs is comparing how envy is so rotten. The bones, the framework of the physical body. And without a healthy framework, the body, what would happen? The body would collapse, right? It would it collapse to nothing but a, 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 just a blob of flesh. Socrates wrote this, and some of you know who Socrates was. He wrote, envy is the daughter of pride, the author of murder and revenge, the perpetual tormentor of virtue. Envy is the filthy slime of the soul, a venom, a poison which consumes the flesh and dries up the bones. It rots us like cancer from the inside. Well, how does envy begin then? Where does it start? Envy begins with comparison. Remember when you were a child? Who remembers show and tell? What grade is show and tell in? Kindergarten? I thought it was senior, but anyway. No. <laughs> show and tell, you remember? And everybody was like, oh, wow. And it's like people, you as a child even, you wanted to show something better than somebody else had. Right. I remember going to our, our Halloween uh, party as a second grader, and in 19, and second grade in 1993. Wait, can't remember what year I was in second grade. Somewhere in the night, maybe it was earlier than that. <laughs> but anyway, I'm not going to tell you what year it was. But Star Wars. If you know what year Star Wars came out, then you'll know what grade I, how old I am. Star Wars came out, and so who did everybody want to dress up as? No. Darth Vader. 
I thought we had Star, I thought we had Star Wars fans here. Anyway, everybody want to dress up like Darth Vader. And so my friend Judd, he uh, had the coolest Darth Vader outfit. I mean, it was so amazing. He actually had the helmet. I had the plastic mask with the little rubber thing that snaps and breaks because my head was too big. <laughs> so I'm walking around with scotch tape, put it on the side of my, sticking my tongue out, you know, trying to hold it up. And my friend, Sean, came to me. It's amazing I can remember these names because I don't forget anything. But my, my friend, Sean, came to me and he said, hey, and they called me Carrie back then. Okay, nobody called me Carrie, but that's what they called me. He said, hey, Carrie, I just want you to know that your costume is not cool. It's not, it's not the good costume. Yours is, yours is not really Darth Vader. He, Judd's is Darth Vader. You know how that made me feel? Right. <laughs> So, but as long as I had candy, it didn't really matter. But envy begins with comparison. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, let's look at this scripture. 2 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 12 says, For we dare not make ourselves of the number, or compare ourselves with some that commend themselves. But they, but they measuring themselves by themselves and comparing themselves among themselves, are not wise. This was a no-no that King David did when he began to number the men in his army. And the Apostle Paul writes to Corinthians, to the, Cor to the Corinthians, and he talk talks to them how, how important it is to not make the same mistakes. So the hurdle with envy is that it's easy to compare what we have or do not have with those who are around us. It's easy to compare. You will go drive to wherever you are, Jonesboro, and somebody always will have a better truck than you. Some will, <laughs> some will always have a better horse than your horse. Some will, <laughs> some will always have a better car than your car, right? It, someone will always have something better. As soon as you get something new, someone else is going to have something newer. I mean, it's just the way it is. But when we look at other people comparatively and competitively, we are not seeing them as our brothers and sisters in the Lord, are we? Huh? In fact, we are not seeing them the way God wants, to see it, wants us to see them. Right? What happens? Well, we begin to judge. Oh, what are they doing spending that money on that? Who do they think they are always flashing all that money, always... You know, then we begin to judge. And God tells us not we're, we're not to judge one another, right? Judge not, lest you be judged. You guys are quiet tonight. Maybe there's a reason. But look at Galatians chapter 6 and verse 4. It says, But let every man prove his own work, and then shall he have rejoicing in himself alone and not in another. For every man shall bear his own burden. The thing the Lord has said to me, and it goes back to when I was working out, at the gym, he says, run your own race. Run your own race. And that is some wisdom that we could use in, in so many aspects of our life. With our children. It's amazing today how parents live out their dreams in their own child. And if, if you don't believe that's true, then go to a football game at Gosnell High School. <laughs> go to a basketball game at Blyville. Go to a baseball game at Armorell. Go somewhere where you see parents and all they're doing is just screaming and yelling and doing all these things. It's amazing. You would think some of these parents, their children are NFL stars. <laughs> it's embarrassing when, they, when a student on the field turns around and tells his dad to shut up because his dad's yelling and screaming at the ref, making a fool out of himself. Look where we have came, right? Sports figures have become idols, and now they become political advisors. <laughs> so help us. I'm not going to go down that. Uh, go, I'm not going to go down that path tonight. But you do know what this is saying when we talk about let every man prove his own work out of Galatians. It's, bas it's basically saying this. We should all test our own actions. 
then we can take pride in ourselves alone without comparing ourselves with someone else. For each of us should carry our own load, run our own race. So we must guard against comparing ourselves with others as much as possible. And because we're flesh, we're always going to have that temptation to compare. And so what we have to do, we have to train ourselves to not use words like better than or worse than when thinking or talking about others, right? When we see God's goodness in the lives of those around us, we shouldn't allow ourselves to be resentful, jealous, and envious. My grandmother Brown would always say, grin and bear it. Well, when you see somebody comes up and they sing and they sound like an angel and it's so amazing, you should say, praise God, right? No, you should say, praise God. Wow, look at the anointing upon that person. That person is a brother or a sister in the Lord, and I admire that, that they're using their gift for the Lord. But today you don't hear that. Today they cross their arms, and they, <laughs> and they say, well, they're just showing out. Hello. Okay, so Romans 12 and 15 says this. It says, rejoice with them that do rejoice and weep with them that weep. So rejoice with those who rejoice instead of resenting their blessings and accomplishments, but celebrate them. Celebrate them. Ecclesiastes 6 and 9 says, Better is the sight of the eyes than the wandering of the desire. Isn't that powerful? This is also vanity and vexation of spirit. I think a reason we don't see the blessings of God in our lives is because of envy. God wants to bless you with more he wants to give you more. He wants to elevate you. He wants to promote you. But he sees how you're handling your present situation. And it's not, it is not holy. It's not honorable. It's not pleasing to him. And so what does he do? He waits. He uh, drops messages in your spirit. And he says... When you begin to deal with these things, then I can bless you. But until then, I'm just going to wait and see what you do with it. You know, I was thinking about some things today, thinking about the church, the direction of the church. And I, I remember the Lord said in my prayer time today, he said, you know, you water, you plant, you water, you plant, you water, you plant. He says, but I give the increase. And there may, be, there may be seasons that that's all you're doing is watering and planting. And you may not see the increase. But as long as you're faithful, God is faithful. And the increase will come at the appointed time. And uh, allowing your eyes to wander and lust after something or someone else is like chasing after the wind. You're never going to catch it. You're never going to capture it. You're never going to get a hold of it. <laughs> someone said, if the grass is greener in someone else's yard, maybe it is time to water your own. Right? Or maybe they're using a little more fertilizer. Or maybe there is more manure. <laughs> right? Over there. <laughs> so there's a lot of things. The best thing to do is, is run your own race take care of yourself. Winston and I, when I love the season that I had with Winston. Uh, we trained him in Young Life uh, ministry that the Lord gave us in the Queen, and for five years, five and a half years, we watched him grow into a man, and his ministry took off, and he was just being used of the Lord. And, but I'll never forget some of his anecdotes, some of his sayings. And he would say things like, uh, Six months to mind my own business and six months to stay out of everybody else's business. And it was funny he would say things like that uh, because really, if you act upon those things, it's helpful. But if you're in everybody else's business, you're not going to grow. You're not going to mature. All you're going to do is just be in everybody else's business. So this is a good thing for you to do right now. Look at somebody. 
and I don't like to point, but point at them and say, listen here, mind your own business. <laughs> now look at somebody else and say that to them too, I dare you. Hey, listen here, across the room, mind your own business. <laughs> so how do I apply this to my life? So what, now what? How do I go from auditing this message to applying it? How can I go from description to prescription? How can I make this message toxic count for life? Our life point is this, envy is incapable of being satisfied. You're always going to want more. This is what James 3 said. Let's say it one more time. Verse 14, but if you have bitter envy and strife in your hearts, glory not and lie not against the truth. This wisdom descendeth not from above, but is earthly, sensual, devilish. For where envy and strife is, there is confusion and every, every, every evil work. I'm going to pause there. I'm going to say one thing before we close. The major problem we have in this country today, and I've said it last year and a year before last, is greed. The bottom line is greed. More and more. It is the same sin that Adam and Eve committed. They were greedy. They thought that their, they would, their eyes would open and they would be as God's. Their eyes were open, but they weren't as God's, were they? Greed. Think of, think of where we're at in, our, in, the, in the economic realm of this nation. So greedy. We, we witnessed it where, where actually our government got involved in the stocks and the bonds to halt the trading because of these shareholders were losing billions of dollars. And so they had to get in and stop and cause apps to pause the trading and turn them off because somebody figured out how to dwindle them, beat them at their own game. Greed. Think about the politics in this nation, the greed. Think about the government where we're at right now, the greed. Think about all of the entertainers and everything that we see that's happening in this world, it's greed. That was not the message of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, was it? His message was to give. Well, I think one way to, appreci one way to appreciate all that we have is do this, is to spend time with people who we are grateful for and joyful about and be excited and joyful for all the things that, that God has given us. I mean, be, be grateful for the things you have. Amen? Because maybe one day we may not have those things. Who knows? God does. I think we should be thankful for what we have. Let's stand together. What if we determined in our heart this evening that, let's just be honest, can we tonight determine in our heart that Jesus, that Jesus is truly enough. That he is truly enough. That we can say, that we can say this evening, beyond anything, maybe our reach and our aim is not in the will of God. Right? And the only, way to, the only way to decipher that is to, is to say, Jesus is who I want. You see, we, our prayer today was about refocus and refocusing. Can we get to the point in our life where, where nothing else truly matters except Jesus? I think some of you have been there before right? I think some of you know what I'm talking about. Some of you have lost a lot and you were to the point where you had, the pressure was on and you had to choose Jesus because nothing else was going to suffice. Nothing else was going to help. And so you had to choose. You were forced to choose. Aren't you glad you chose Jesus? Good news about this is that, see, he He's chosen us. We choose him, but he's already chosen us. 
And that's what's so beautiful about God today. Father, in the name of Jesus, we love you, and we're so thankful, Lord, for this evening. How crucial it is to present your word because souls are at stake. There may be people tonight watching, maybe people tonight in this room, maybe a person in this room who needed to hear this message that Christ has chose us. And we don't want to distract that. We don't want to take, we don't want to miss this opportunity. But if there are people here this evening, Father, and your spirit is drawing them, give us the green light. Give us the green light to, to, so we will know this evening, Father, that your grace is sufficient. Your love is everlasting. Your mercies are new every morning. With your head bowed and your eyes closed, you say, Pastor JC, I'm here, not by accident, but it's a commission by our Heavenly Father. And he's dealing with my heart to just choose Christ, to choose Jesus above everything, above everyone, above all. If that's you this evening with an uplifted hand, we say, Pastor, will you pray for me? The Holy Spirit's, I see your hands. God bless you. I see your hands. I see hands. Yes, 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 yes. I see hands in this room. That's so wonderful. Father, I thank you for the integrity and the honesty of people that have raised their hands tonight. You have not allowed any, any confusion in this room, any distractions in this room to keep our eyes off of you because we're focused tonight upon what matters the most, and that is eternity. And Father, those that raised their hands, Lord, I knew it took courage to do so. But I pray, Father, tonight, God, that, Lord, your presence, your spirit would come in such a contact with their heart, with their minds, to give them confidence, Lord, that these things that they're facing, these trials they're facing, these questions that they have, that you are not just enough, but you're more than enough. That the decisions that they'll have to make, that you will be with them and you'll guide them, you'll direct them, that you will prove to them that you're the way, the truth, and the life. So, Father, we will just visit them right now in the mighty name of Jesus. From the crown of their head to the soles of their feet. And that you will bless them. And honor them. And guide them. In the mighty name of Jesus. While your head is bowed and your eyes closed, I, Ashley, I don't have not met your friend that is with, with you to this evening. I'm glad that you've brought her. And I would no way embarrass anybody. But I, wanna, I have a word for your friend. I didn't get her name tonight. But the girl in the pink shirt, I want you to know that the Lord knows your need. And he knows what you've been through. And he is with you. He has seen your past. And the enemy has tried to bring up your past and tell you all the things that's not, that you're not worthy. The devil is a liar. God is saying to you today that he has, he has in store for you things greater than you've ever imagined. Because there were times in your life that you sought after his presence and you looked to him, but the devil has tried to keep you off, off course. But you're here tonight for a specific purpose, and that is this word that the Lord has given you, that greater days are before you. And he's just calling on you to surrender everything. Surrender everything to him. Ashley, will you just put your arm around her tonight and just let her know that she's loved, she's cared for. The tears that she's crying this evening are tears of joy because he's going to take the heaviness, he's going to take the pain, he's going to take the confusion, he's going to take all that away this evening. 
He said, if any man be in, in Christ, he is a new creature. All things are passed away. Behold, all things become new. There's a transition taking place from the crown of her head to the soles of her feet. Yes. I see the Lord show me something. I see restoration happening with a family member. I don't know who it is. I don't have to know. But I see you and this family member where there's been animosity and trepidation. God is bringing you back and God is restoring you. He is restoring this relationship. Yes, he's restoring this relationship in the mighty name of Jesus. Our church motto is this. This place is a house of restoration. And this journey begins tonight, restoration for you and your family in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Thank you for it, Father. We praise and exalt you. God, you are so awesome. Let's just lift our hands toward heaven and thank him and praise him this evening because we're seeing God do something amazing in someone's life. We may came tonight, didn't think that we needed anything, but you know what? It's not about us. It's all about God. It's all about him. It's about others. Thank God tonight for his blessings. Thank the Lord that he touched us. He strengthened us. He has came in contact with us this evening. Heaven's rejoicing this evening. Thank you so much, God. You are so good to us, and we love you, and we praise you, and we exalt you. Glory to God. Hallelujah to his name. Your name is beautiful. Your name is wonderful. You are king. You are Lord of lords. You're Jehovah. You are the I am that I am. Thank you so much. We praise and worship you. Let your blessings be upon the lives of your people, Father. Take us further than we've ever dreamed of going in you, God. Create in us a new heart, a clean heart. Renew within us a right spirit, a right attitude. In Jesus' name, thank you, Father, for it. Let's lift our hands toward heaven. Let's hear an Arianic Konim blessing, first in Hebrew, then in English. Yevarach. The Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord shine his face upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord look upon you and give you peace. Arise, shine, for the light is come and the glory of the Lord is risen upon thee. For behold, the darkness shall cover the earth and gross darkness to people, but the Lord shall arise upon thee and his glory shall be seen upon thee.